Good morning, everyone. So there's a few things that um, I think I didn't talk about last time that I wanted to talk about in the syllabus, so I had, hadn't actually gone through any part of the lecture syllabus. Um, if you haven't navigated to this yet, I'm sure a lot of you have already found it, but in syllabus on the tab, we can click on the lecture syllabus. There's a separate lab syllabus that you'll be going over in lab, so I'll let lab take care of that one. But let's... The main things I wanted to show were the grade scale in the syllabus and talk a little bit about that. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is for uh, office hour information, you're gonna find that in the contacts page. If you go back to the main page, the front page of Carmen, there's a contacts page. Click on that, that's where you find my office hours. Just as a reminder there, Monday, Friday afternoons, two to three, and then Wednesday mornings, 8.30 to 9.30. Um, I'm happy to answer questions by email. Uh, we can occasionally set up meetings if needed um, outside of those times, just let me know. Um, so you have also links and contact information for lab supervisors. Uh, for the class, you'll see information about them as well in the lab syllabus. But when I, oh, I wanted to mention the calculator policy. I think I mentioned this last time, TI-30s, 83s, 84s. Um, if you don't have one of those calculators, definitely go after the TI-30s, uh, they're cheaper. Um, the TI-30 X2S kind of looks like a little bit of a graphing calculator, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, the uh, grade scale is somewhere in here. So here's the breakdown of the class. We had talked about that. So about 10% for recitation, for homework, for each of the first four, uh, each of the four midterms. The final is 20%, labs 20%. And then in terms of the grade scale, the thing I wanted to mention with the grade scale is that um, We've already kind of considered rounding into the scale. I want to say that up front so that when we get to the end of the semester, if you're kind of close to the next highest cut, our rounding is usually po uh, 0 .100, 0, and like that's it. And so sometimes that's a surprise, and sometimes that's uh, unfortunate for those who end up you know, 0 .005 below that line. Uh, but just know rounding isn't something um, that we're going to do outside of about 0 0.1, almost exactly 0 .100%. Uh, percent onto these specific grade cuts here. Um, so uh, that's what to expect in terms of grades. I think this is a pretty fair grade scale. Last semester, we ended up with about 25% solid A's in my class. Uh, we ended up with a uh, GPA average of about 2.9, uh, which is into the upper B minus range. Uh, so I think certainly the uh, possibilities for getting good grades is, uh, is there for this class. The uh, chapter schedule is kind of shown. The uh, breakdown of material, we talk about kind of introduction to chemistry, some terminology, uh, some math examples here early in chapter one. Uh, chapter two, atom molecules, ions. We get into chapter three, we get into chemical reactions. Uh, chapter four gets into reactions in water. Uh, so aqueous reactions are just reactions in water. So things like precipitation reactions, where you form a solid. Uh, Acid-base reactions, where acids and bases you might think of acids as containing H plus or releasing H plus, bases as releasing hydroxide ion. H plus and hydroxide ion form water. Uh, so we'll talk about those reactions in chapter three. Uh, chapter, or excuse me, in chapter four. Chapter five gets into heat changes of chemical reactions. We call it thermochemistry. And then six, seven, eight, and nine kind of build towards molecular structure, kind of starting with electronic structure, the structure of uh, and some of the properties of electrons. Um, into nuclear properties in chapter seven, into bonding chapter eight, and then three-dimensional shapes of molecules in chapter nine. And then we wrap up with gases, liquid, solids in terms of the class. Uh, the lecture schedule is kind of shown. You'll see that in the reading assignment. And then way towards the end is the exam schedule. So exams are week four, week seven, week nine, uh, right before spring break with that third exam, and then three weeks later of content for exam four. And then we take that final, I think it's Thursday of finals week. So the first Thursday um, after classes end on a Monday. Okay, so with that, I just wanted to point out a couple details in the syllabus. The other reminder uh, or reminders is setting up your eText access if you haven't done that yet. There's a link on the main page for setting that access up. So just navigate to the main page of Carmen. Uh, look for the getting started link. Look for the online homework access. There's a code that you use. And again, remember, don't pay for it. You've already paid for it through your student fees. And then the uh, first assignment's due uh, for class Friday morning. Uh, the late penalty is 1% per hour late. So if you don't get to it by Friday morning, just get to it as soon as you can after class. 
for a very small penalty. Uh, but I'll be checking in to see, hopefully most of the class can get in there and do that assignment. Um, if you have any issues accessing the homework, there's a help file in that getting started link that has tech office hours, uh, so check those out. Some of the sometimes issues we, we find are students who have had uh, Pearson accounts in the past don't jive with the settings for the new class. So that's usually where we see some issues where you have to meet with a, a tech person just to get the settings sorted out on your Pearson account. So if you have issues, just check, check that information out. So with that, we'll head back into our notes here. And so we uh, had left off, I was mentioning this reaction here is one that we often do. I'm not entirely sure where they fill the balloon with. Let me see. So last time they were telling me they were out of oxygen, uh, presumably they found some O2 to put in the balloon. So what we're going to do is a chemical reaction of hydrogen plus oxygen uh, forming water. I'm going to record it as well. So we're going to have to cuff our ears really good. This is going to be really loud unless they didn't find that oxygen. So we'll see in a minute if they found oxygen. So this is going to be really loud. we got to cuff our ears with our palms when I'm getting ready to detonate. Um, I'm going to record it. I can post it. So don't try to record and cuff your ears. Uh, so let's see our first chemical reaction. Story about this, whatever. I'm going to move this back just a little bit. Again, make sure to cup your ears when I'm going to detonate it. Get those ears getting cuffed. Use the palms of your hands. Get them real tight. It's going to be loud. <laughs> All right, that was our first chemical reaction. Anyone? Hopefully that recorded. Okay, so what we, what we did was we made water. I mean, so all of that just to make water. Now, why did we make water? Well, hydrogen, uh, that was the elemental form of hydrogen in its gaseous state, and oxygen. Really interesting, they're semi-stable together. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about energy in this chapter. They're kind of sitting at the top of the hill. They're at the top of the hill. They're like a bicyclist just waiting to be pushed down that hill. And as soon as we give that reaction a little bit of a push, there it goes. And we form water. Uh, the driving force, the energy we see, is at delta H negative 483.6. We'll talk about that in chapter uh, 5. That's the heat being given off by the reaction. It's a fast reaction, so the heat comes off very quickly. And so we see that energy um, given off in, a, in the form of a fireball. So the energy is given off by the exothermic reaction. Talk about that term uh, in chapter five. And so we also have a few terminology things we'll see on the next slide. We have elements. So H2 is the elemental form of hydrogen. O2 is the elemental form of oxygen. So oxygen doesn't exist at room temperature as oxygen atoms, it exists as a diatomic molecule. So this turns out to be the most stable form of oxygen at room temperature. Um, oxygen exists as two oxygens bonded together. You've probably seen this Lewis structure before. This Lewis structure comes up in chapter eight in terms of how to sketch it. So I don't necessarily expect that you know how to sketch random Lewis structures at this point, but I just want us to think O2 has some type of connection between two oxygen atoms. And so if we had a sample like we had before of O2, we had a bunch of individual molecules of O2. So in terms of how many molecules, well, we got to get into maybe chapter 10 to start thinking about that. But you're going to be talking about 
millions and millions and millions of individual molecules where we have distinctly two oxygen atoms connected together. So our, our balloon had been filled up with millions of little molecules that look like O2, and then also with a bunch of molecules that look like H2. And so what happens is we take, for every two molecules of H2, one molecule of O2, and we rearrange the bonds so that we end up forming two molecules of water. And again, in terms of the Lewis structures, we'll see those in chapter eight for rules for sketching them. If, I'm sure you've seen it before, uh, but if you forget how, we'll talk about those later. And so this is the way the chemical reaction goes. So we start with these here, we break those bonds. So we break the bonds here and we make these new chemical bonds between oxygen and hydrogen. So chemical reactions are where we're actually changing the chemical bonding between the reactants and the products. So a chemical reaction is where we exchange the uh, types of bonds between the uh, atoms and the reactants compared to the products. Um, so we have a lot of different terms. We have the fact that each molecule here contains two atoms. So two H atoms and H2, two O atoms and O2. We also could look at H2 and call this a molecule. The next slide has a bunch of definitions on it, but just to kind of start thinking about some different terminology, we can talk about how one molecule of H2 contains two H atoms, one molecule of water contains two H atoms, one O atom. So we can start breaking down that we're exchanging bonds between our molecules of H2 and O2 into what we can call also a molecule. A molecule is just a collection of atoms, so if we have two or more atoms bonded together, uh, we call that a molecule. The bonding type is somewhat like, like th there's a little bit of nuance between something like NaCl, where we usually don't call this a molecule because we don't actually see the exchange of electrons here. We don't see an electron pair being shared between sodium and chlorine. We tend to call the compounds that have covalent bonds molecules. Now, how do you know how to spot molecular compounds from what we might call NaCl to be an ionic compound? Well, that'll come up as we get through, like maybe in the chapter four, when we start looking at some different properties that molecular compounds have compared to ionic compounds, in particular when they're in water. But ionic compounds kind of vary in their nature. Sodium chloride just alternates plus and minus ions in a different fundamental way than, say, a sample of hydrogen or water does. So if we're, if we're looking at a uh, crystal of sodium chloride, the sodium chloride crystal would just have sodium chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride, in all three dimensions through the crystal. If we're looking at a sample of water, let's say it's liquid water, um, what we would have is a bunch of individual water molecules that look something like this, and then we'd have one right next to it and they'd all be moving around. Where on average though, or in any given moment, two hydrogens stuck to an oxygen, bonded at all times, and then another mo water molecule next door, where maybe they have some intermolecular forces that kind of stick and hold them together so that the molecule um, exists in that liquid state. Liquid states we talked about in chapter 11. So there's a whole lot going on with this one reaction that kind of sends us into a lot of different directions in terms of topics and uh, things that we'll talk about in this class. So we see the existence of intermolecular forces, that's liquids, that's chapter 11. We see structure, that's chapter eight. Three-dimensional shapes, that's chapter nine. So a lot of different topics kind of coming together here with this one basic chemical reaction to kind of get us started with. Uh, in our first demonstration. Okay, kind of the, let's sum up a few things here. So, um, so our basic terminology, kind of how we can summarize a few things. Atoms are a basic building blocks of matter. So matter, all matter is comprised of atoms. Um, each atom is defined by its nucleus. Um, so we have our periodic table giving us elements like hydrogen, helium, lithium, et cetera, where the difference between, and this is a chapter two concept that we'll talk about in chapter two, but what makes hydrogen and helium different is specifically the number of protons in the nucleus of those atoms. Hydrogen just has one, it's element number one. Helium has two, it's element number two. So the element number, if we look at, you know, for example, oxygen eight, means it has eight protons in its nucleus. So the atom of oxygen is defined specifically by having eight protons in the nucleus. Uh, we'll get into things like atomic weight, where an atom gets its atomic weight is also from the neutrons, the neutral particles in the nucleus. Um, the neutral particles, there's a specific count that's, um, well, in some ways more stable, but also just um, 
indicative of how these atoms were made, uh, presumably in the Big Bang. So you have Big Bang takes place, all these atoms are made, and some of them are stable, some of them aren't stable, the not stable ones decay into the more stable ones. And so the elements we see on Earth are indicative of what is at this point present. You know, so it's kind of the, a snapshot in time of where all the things that had been decaying at this moment in time are currently at. So like, we'll get into in chapter two how carbon, for example, you may have seen this before, is about 99% carbon-12. And again, we'll talk about what carbon-12 means, but you might remember that means carbon has six protons, element number six. Carbon-12 would have six neutrons. So it has six protons, six neutrons, six plus six is 12. We'll define that later. But about 99% of a carbon sample is carbon-12, about 1% is carbon-13, a very small trace is carbon-14. And those traces have to do with the natural processes that had made those atoms that we get to see here today. Um, so elements are defined by the nucleus. Now, in terms of the periodic table, you get one on exam. So you never don't get a periodic table when you need it. Uh, but the problem, as you can see, is you usually don't get the name of the element. So what we want to make sure is that if I say potassium, we all are looking at element 19 for K. So what I want to make sure that we know is the name versus symbol for the first row, or the first um, group of elements, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. We could argue the, the francium row is all radioactive. I mean, those aren't going to be examples that you see. Those aren't compounds you're going to be handling. But cesium chloride is a common compound. You may see that or work with examples of that in the class. Barium right next door is also a common ion. We'll see that in a lot of examples. So we want to know the beryllium group as well in terms of just the name to symbol, symbol to name combinations. We want to make sure the halogen group, the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, the next to last group of elements, we want to make sure we know those. Those are common. We'll talk about those a lot. But those are pretty easy. When the element symbol is predicted off the name, makes it easy, like iodine I, that's pretty easy. The ones that are tricky are like magnesium Mg, manganese Mn, iron Fe, cobalt versus copper with the CO versus the Cu. Those are the ones that if we say like copper chloride and you need to look up a mass, we want to make sure we know that that's element 29, Cu. So if you're not sure, what I would do is the first two groups, the last two groups, we also want to know the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. Radon is actually very important. Does anybody know what a radon mitigation system is? Anybody who's bought a house, you may have asked the seller to put one in. It's something you put in the basement to try to pump the air out of the basement because radon being heavy settles in, in basements. Uh, Ohio has uh, a lot of radon. So if you, have, if you live in a basement, make sure there's a radon mitigation system down there because radon causes uh, lung cancer. Uh, so uh, radon mitigation system tries to remove uh, radon from especially the lower levels of dwellings. Okay, so radon's important, uh, symbols RN. Um, and so then, other than those, the first four rows. So through the, um, uh, the potassium, calcium, scandium, titanium, that's probably the limit in terms of the other elements. A few ones come up a bunch that are probably so obvious or once we start doing examples like silver, AG, well, that's more common in examples. Gold, AU, we want to collect it too, so we want to know it's symbol AU. Mercury next door is in some examples, HG and then lead PB. I think we mentioned those because their symbols aren't entirely predicted based on their name. Um, so those are just a few examples um, of symbols that I would make sure, just the name to symbol, symbol to name. You don't have to reconstruct the periodic table. You don't have to put it together. You don't have to memorize the atomic numbers. Um, you get the periodic table with symbols, atomic numbers, and we'll talk about average atomic weights later, but we get that information as well. So. Um, I think I was getting into this, but I didn't quite fully finish this on the last slide. But water is an example of a compound. But H2 is an example of just not a compound. Because a compound has to have at least two elements. So two elements have to be present in a compound. So we can look at the H2 and the O2, and we can call these elements. We can call them molecules, but we can't call them compounds. We look at water, we can call it a compound. We can also call it a molecule. 
We often call it a molecular compound. So a compound comprised of molecules. So chemical versus physical reactions. Well, chemical reactions, what we just saw, a chemical reaction is one, if you think about it, it's one where you're not just going to easily go backwards. It's something where we broke bonds that were present and changed them. So a chemical reaction involves the change of chemical bonds. Physical reactions just lead to changes in phase, temperature, pressure, and usually it's easy to go backwards. Like you can uh, melt a solid and you can freeze a solid. You can vaporize a gas. If you collect it, you can recondense it. And so you can imagine for physical changes, you can usually imagine going backwards very easily. Uh, it's going to be very hard for us to put the H2 and O2 back together. So if we want to put H2 and O2 back together, I'm going to have to do another chemical reaction. I'm maybe going to have to electrolyze water. You can, do, through electrolysis, take water back to H2 and O2, but not just by simple uh, means. I can't just change the temperature and flip that reaction backwards. Um, and then intensive versus extensive properties are mentioned in chapter uh, one. And I think the main thing here is that anything that's intensive is going to be a sort of quantity independent value. It doesn't depend on how much of the substance that you have. It depends on the substance itself. So an intensive property is characteristic. So something like a boiling point, like most substances have different boiling points. Water boils at 100 degrees C. Ethanol boils at like 78 degrees C. So that's an intensive property of those substances. It's a characteristic property. So we want to know the difference between a property that characterizes the substance versus an extensive property that just um, sort of tells us how much of the substance there is. So an extensive property is a quantity dependent value and just relates to how much of the substance we actually happen to contain. So for example, the mass of a sample is clearly an extensive property. You can have 10 grams of water, you can have 10 grams of ethanol. Having 10 grams of the substance doesn't, doesn't characterize which of the substances you happen to contain. So any substance you can have 10 grams of, that's an extensive property of the substance. Same thing with volume. We can have 30 milliliters of one liquid, 30 molecules of some other substance. That's not a characteristic property of the substance. But the mass to volume ratio, the density of a liquid, is characteristic. And so the density of a substance, if I had 30 milliliters of water, it's roughly going to be 30 grams, right? Because the density of water is one gram per milliliter. So the ratio we know, the ratio of the density of water is a characteristic property, but the mass or the volume are extensive properties. Those just depend on how much water we have. No matter if you have 30 mils or if you have 100 mils, the density is still one gram per milliliter. Uh, now, if you look at the density of some other liquid, that density could be a different value. So if you have a different substance, has a different density, a different volume gives you a different mass, um, and then that uh, mass and volume, again, extensive, the intensive properties or the independent of quantity, they're the characteristic properties. So again, think of the properties that characterize the substance, those are intensive properties. So just a term that sometimes comes up, but I think it's just really getting us to, trying to get us to think about the difference between a property that characterize, characterizes the quantity of the substance versus the actual substance itself. Now, I mentioned heat here too. You may be wondering what about you know, heat. If you have um, a pot of water, you have a lot of heat sort of, you've heated it up and it was boiling. There's a lot of heat stored um, in that uh, pot. If you have a small pot with water in it, it takes less heat to heat it up, there's less heat stored. So heat itself is quantity dependent. Okay, so this slide here is just a pictorial representation of what it means to kind of have a sample that exists as an um, atom. Now there's only really one group of elements that we can look at in the periodic table that exist stable at room temperature as atoms, and these would be our noble gases. So if we had a helium sample, or a neon sample, et cetera, it would look like individual atoms of those elements because the noble gases are stable as monoatomic gases. And so they're the only elements that are stable as gases in their single atom form. So we have a helium gas cylinder, then we have a bunch of individual atoms of helium. They're not sitting still, they're bouncing around the container. Uh, we'll talk about the kinetic energy distribution, the velocity distribution of those molecules in chapter 10. Uh, but that would be an example of an atomic gas sample that looks like something in box A. Box B might be a pictorial representation of maybe something like an N2 gas sample. So we have a nitrogen gas cylinder. Uh, for some reason, nitrogen atoms are usually blue in examples. But, um, but if we're just picturing two atoms that are the same, so the same color would tell us we have the same atom connected together, 
And then we have one N2 molecule, another N2 molecule, and these would all be bouncing around the container. So a gas is going to expand to fill its container, so these molecules are just going to be bouncing into each other and have a relatively fast velocity uh, compared to if you have a liquid. If you imagine we liquefy a gas, molecules are going to slow down, move slower, but still be moving. So we're never going to take a substance and completely have the atoms immobile. The atoms or the molecules are always going to be moving around. Uh, even if we get close to zero Kelvin, I don't think we're ever going to get to zero Kelvin for a real sample, but even as we approach really low temperatures, atoms are still moving, maybe slowly, but they still have some movement. So the next example is showing us a compound, so maybe, um, I don't know, maybe something like BF3 or something like that. Um, we just have the connection between two different um, elements. How do I know there's two elements? Well, the different colors just tell me I have different atom types. So it's just from the fact I see two colors, I see two different elements, and they're roughly in a three to one ratio. So a molecule that exists like that is boron trifluoride. We'll talk about how to name compounds when we get into chapter two. And then, um, so this might be just an example of the molecules of a compound in a gas sample. So again, we're picturing gaseous samples. And then lastly, you can imagine having all kinds of random mixtures. So you can take a mixture of helium, a mixture of nitrogen, a mixture maybe of that BF3, and so we can have a mixture. So you can imagine having all different kinds of mixtures. We'll talk about a few of those in a couple moments in terms of how we can characterize uh, samples as either being homogeneous mixtures or heterogeneous mixtures. And so this here would be what we call a homogeneous mixture, meaning it's mixed equally or mixed completely randomly. Um, and so gases form, now nah, it's terribly written. So gases are always going to form homogeneous mixtures because the particles are just bouncing around the container randomly. So we're not going to get some of the molecules conglomerating on one side, the other molecules on the other, because they're just in pure random motion. And we'll talk about that random motion more when we get to chapter 10. The states of matter are mentioned here. Um, you know, obviously you can imagine something like ice melting into liquid water. What's going on is you're going from what looks more like a lattice structure, but it's important to think about ice as those water molecules not being static. It's not like the water molecules are not moving at all, and then we melt water, then they're moving. They're just moving slowly. And then we melt, and then they tumble around each other, and then we boil, and then we vaporize those particles into their gaseous state. This isn't to scale. If we wanted to boil the mixture, we'd have to expand maybe a big balloon or something, and then we can imagine recondensing the water if we cooled the sample back down, back into liquid water, refreeze it if we cool down. So we obviously know that below zero degrees C, we're in the ice, zero to 100. At standard atmospheric pressure, we're in the liquid state, and above 100 degrees C for water, we're in the vapor state. And so for substances, it, the uh, sample needs so much energy to melt, and so that's why you reach a point. So it takes so much energy, you reach a point, as soon as molecules reach that energy, they melt, and then they're tumbling around each other in the liquid state, they reach the energy it takes to vaporize, then you have that boiling point. So the kind of reason why we have a distinct point at which you change from liquid to solid is because you have that minimum energy it takes to vaporize. So all the molecules are trying to get to that minimum energy. As soon as they do, we vaporize. To get to that minimum energy is that 100 degree point for the case of water, different points for different substances. So we mentioned ethanol 78 degrees C. Don't have to memorize that, but it just means at 78 degrees C, we will reach enough energy for ethanol to boil. Uh, we'll talk more about liquids in chapter 11. So this is kind of our chapter 10, chapter 11, and then chapter 12, bit of a preview here. So we'll see more about gases, liquids, solids when we get through the class. This slide here is talking about how we can try to break matter down. Now, this slide like, is kind of confusing in a way uh, because some of the questions aren't easily answerable without more information, but let's just take a look at the um, sort of flow chart. The idea would be you have a sample of some sort of substance and you're trying to figure out is there one thing present, two things present, multiple components of that mixture. Is the mixture atomic? Is there just one element present? Are there multiple elements present? Those are the kind of questions you're trying to think of addressing. So the first question that usually you would try to think of 
is, well, let's look at it. This is one question that we can look at the sample and usually answer just by sight. And so the question would be, does the sample look homogenous? It doesn't mean we're asking, is it a homogenous mixture? We used the word homogenous mixture earlier, but let's take that word mixture out right now and just think, we're just looking at a, a beaker that has a clear liquid in it that would look homogenous. Like, let's say we also have a beaker that has a distinctly blue color to it. That would look homogenous too. If we look into a beaker and we see a bottom layer and a top layer, and let's say the bottom layer is yellow and the top layer is clear, that's distinctly not homogenous. That's distinctly heterogeneous. And so if we're looking at a sample and we see solid floating in a liquid sample, that's definitely not going, to, well, if the solid's floating randomly, we might say that's homogenous. If the solid's sinking down and mostly at the bottom, then we would probably call that heterogeneous. So we're just looking at the sample. Does it look to be the same throughout? If it is, we call that uh, homogenous. And if we see a distinctly different sort of appearance, if we see two layers, if we can see two different parts that aren't equally mixed, then we're calling that a heterogeneous mixture because we at least have to have two different substances present. We once asked a really dumb question before, which was like ice water. Is that a heterogeneous mixture or is that a pure substance? And it's like, oh my God, that's so tricky because it's like ice, so, so, solid water is a different substance from liquid water. So ice water would actually be an example of a heterogeneous mixture because we have different substances. You may not think water ice is a different substance, but that is a different chemical substance than liquid water. And so if you had um, a uh, oil and water mixture where the oil and water have separated, then that would be an example of a heterogeneous mixture. If you were good at cooking or something, you knew you could add like a mayo or like a, a mustard or something to the oil and water and shake it up and they would form an emulsion, then that would look to be homogenous. So if you are, uh, if you can distinctly mix the oil and water and have them stick together, then that would actually appear to be homogenous. So you can actually mix oil and water, but if you just had oil and water with two different phases, you see how that's a, what we would call heterogeneous. So then we're going back to looking at a sample, like let's say it's clear liquid, it looks like it could be water. Um, of course, we're never gonna believe it's water. Like if I handed you a, a beaker in the lab and said, yeah, this is pure water, you, you would look at it and go, well, it's clear and drink it, right? You would wanna do some more testing. So the next question, does it have a variable composition, is not something you can look at. So you can't just like look at a sample unless you have like spectrometer eyes. You can't really look at a sample and determine if it's sodium chloride in water, sugar in water, or pure water, or something else in water. Here you have to know something about the sample. Let me even add the word you need to know something about the sample to address that second question. Like you physically need to know, you know, I added a couple things in this water, they may have reacted to something, probably gonna be at least two different substances there along with, you know, that water. And so the variable composition would be, if I'm looking with like laser goggles or whatever, if I had the ability to see the sample, it's like, am I looking at two distinct molecules that are the same? So if I'm looking at the molecules, do they look to be the same? Or if I'm using my laser uh, vision, do I see some other molecule? Where I see some other type of, of molecule? Like, like I'm using just open spheres versus shaded spheres to represent two different types of atoms. But I'd be looking at this and saying this does have a variable composition. So seeing two different molecules or knowing there's two different molecules um, or substances present in that homogeneous mixture tells you that it is indeed a homogeneous mixture. But then if we're looking with our laser goggles and we only see something that looks like this, so every time we look we see the same molecule, then we're saying that's a pure substance. And so now the question would be, can I break that substance down into two or more different types of substances? Can I take the one substance and break it apart into two or more? And if you can, then it's a compound. So you're breaking it apart into its elements at that point. Um, or this one here would look like the same atom. So if I tried to break this substance down into different substances, I would have the same element present. So 
We classify, um, we have a homogeneous substance that by eye we can tell. We then use our laser goggles or know something about the sample to know there's just one uh, molecule present. And then we try to break it down into its elements, only one element present, so then that sample, that pure substance, was an elemental sample. Break it down into two elements or more, then you had a compound. Okay, weird slide. It just, there are a couple questions, I think one follows this in terms of trying to understand a sample. Let me take us into Carmen. There's like two questions back to back in the notes that we'll just do as the first two questions in uh, today's lecture kind of quiz. So there's a lecture two, or lecture survey. So lecture two survey. Oh, yeah, I was trying to remember the name. So the, uh, the password for today is everybody's favorite, sig figs, which we'll be getting into hopefully in a little bit. So which term best describes table sugar? So think about how you might, if you have a packet of table sugar, how might you want to classify that sample? Is it mostly molecules? Does it contain a compound? Is it homogenous? The sample's a heterogeneous mixture. Think about which of those terms is the best term to apply, and then you can... Okay, so if you're still entering answers, it's just like the lecture engagement. This, this quiz was a little bit screwed up today, so hopefully they're a little bit smoother next time. But um, the idea is just to hopefully get you guys thinking about problems. I should have prompted you that you could chat with your neighbors too and double check your answers. Um, and I also, of course, forgot the word not when I was um, describing the problem. But which term does not describe the sample of table sugar? Well, you may not even know what table sugar is exactly. You know it's some kind of sugar. It turns out that sh table sugar is a mixture of sucrose and fructose, almost in equal amounts. And so the sample does contain molecules because fructose and, and sugars, those are molecules. Um, so we could look at the structures if we wanted to of those molecules. Um, they, um, of, of course, are compounds because you might be thinking that these are C12H22O11 um, molecular formulas. So those are the formulas of sucrose and fructose. Um, fructose may be C6H12O6, but, but those are the kind of basic formulas of a monosaccharide versus a disaccharide type sugar. Um, the sample would appear to be homogeneous. Like we think of table sugar as being a white powder that is, um, looks the same throughout. The term that does not apply is a heterogeneous mixture. So the sample wouldn't be heterogeneous. That would be if we saw like sugar as one side was one color, or another side was a different, or we saw two different layers, we saw two different shades of color, let's say, or something along those lines. So just a heterogeneous mixture is a term that would not apply to the sample of table sugar. After you look at that question, think about a uh, pencil a pencil, we call a lead pencil a lead pencil. It doesn't really contain lead, it contains graphite. Graphite is a form of carbon. So think about which term would apply to the form of carbon that we use in a pencil. So you can give those two questions a try, and if you want to then, as soon as you're done, hit submit. Um, you can reopen it later if you want to put in questions that you have for that final question. And I don't think we'll do any other questions in this packet today. And then for the next question, which substance is best described as a pure element? The lead in a lead pencil, as we we're talking about, is the elemental form of carbon. So it is graphite. Graphite is very interesting. Graphite is like a three-dimensional array of carbon atoms, almost like a flat plane of carbon atoms that is then, by electrostatic force, is connected to another plate of carbon atoms that's then connected to another plate of carbon atoms in terms of a structure you might think of being in a lead pencil. And so this is just what we think of as, as being carbon solid in that graphite form. Interestingly, if you think of the two-dimensional sheets of carbon atoms, if you made that a three-dimensional array of carbon atoms instead, then that would be diamond. So you can take graphite, um, if you could, turn it into diamond by just changing the bonding nature between the atoms. It's very hard to do. But um, if you could do that, you'd be changing the bonding nature changing the properties, you'd have a different substance, those still comprise the same atoms. So a quick little term here would be that these are allotropes. That different forms of the same element are what we call allotropes. 
And so another set of examples of an allotrope might be like O2 for oxygen, the elemental form of oxygen at room temperature, versus ozone. So those two would be allotropes as well. So they're different forms of the same element. So I think allotropes comes up in chapter two, I think, as an actual term. But just to mention the term here, there's different forms of the same element, graphite versus diamond, are allotropes, O2 versus O3, oxygen versus ozone, are allotropes as well. You can imagine we know O2 is more stable. That's why it exists in our atmosphere and not ozone predominantly. And then graphite, you can presume, is more stable because that's the cheaper version of it, the more expensive, lesser stable version is the diamond form. So then, uh, what about the others? Black coffee, of course, is a, a mixture of different substances of water and what makes the coffee coffee. The air we breathe is a mixture of O2, N2. Actually, argon is the next most abundant atom in the, or, or substance in the atmosphere, uh, the noble gas argon. Um, and then we also have things like CO2, water, et cetera, in the atmosphere. So the air we breathe is a mixture, not a pure element. Um, it's a mixture of a bunch of different elemental samples. Um, predominantly, 99% plus of air are O2, N2, and argon. An ice cube, of course, is a compound. So just the lead is the answer to the next question. Okay, so next couple of slides just talk about how if you had a mixture, how might you separate the mixture? And these are just like a, maybe more of a lab topic that you might see these in lab. Um, usually you don't see too many lecture examples of these, but if we wanted to take a solid and a liquid, we can just filter off the liquid from the solid. So filtration is an easy way to separate liquids and solids. And so another interesting thing you could do is if you had, like let's say you had a mixture in water where it was homogeneous, so everything was dissolved in water. If we could add a precipitating agent to pull one of the things out, then we could separate the, the components of that mixture. So we can separate by use of filtration if we could take a liquid and add a precipitating agent for one of the substances or components in water. Um, and so you'll do something like this in the PBI lab uh, where you'll be making like lead iodide and kind of separating it out from what was uh, two solutions that were perfectly mixed in water, two homogeneous solutions. So another, another separation technique is distillation. Um, so spirits are an example that uses distillation. And so let's say we have, have a mixture, salt water is the example here, but you can imagine having uh, some sort of uh, fermented alcohol where you're trying to make a spirit, maybe a vodka or something. And so you can heat up the mixture. The mixture is going to lead to a vapor that's going to contain more of the compounds of the lower boiling substance. So the lower the boiling the substance, the more it's going to be present in the vapors and we can condense those vapors um, and collect and purify what was salt water and collect mostly water because water is the lower boiling of the two between water and NaCl. Um, so you can separate water and salt water. Now, I think you have to do this multiple times. You can't just do this once for salt water. Um, and then the same thing for uh, like an ethanol being distilled off. Ethanol boils at 78 degrees C, water at a higher temperature. Uh, so if you heat up a mixture that's relatively low in alcohol percentage, the vapors will be more saturated in the alcohol, and then you can collect those uh, vapors. And again, it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to get 100, you'll actually never get 100% alcohol. Once you get to about 95% alcohol, uh, with the other 5% being water, they boil at the same temperature. So you're going to be collecting the same, same component. So the, the vapor pressure, the vapors above that sample contain the same uh, percentage of alcohol and water as the original sample. So about 95%, um, so for grain alcohol, that's about our limit. And then obviously most spirits don't get as high as that. So you're usually talking 40 to 50% for a stopping point for most um, spirits. Not that we know anything about that. Um, not after watching that football game Monday night made me want to find a bottle of spirits. But um, so then chromatography is another separation technique. Um, and so chromatography, we actually see this with like ink pens. If you use a, a black pen and you have a liquid run through the, the ink, the ink will separate the papers actually um, acting as a solid support for the dyes in the blue uh, uh, ink to separate. And you start to see the blue and the purple color separate because they travel through the paper with different rates. You will probably never see an example of chromatography in this class. You'll see it in OCHEM if you take organic chemistry. Um, so the idea here is we add a mixture to a column. This column is filled with like silica gel. Imagine it's filled with something like sand or something, some sort of solid material. And then as the compounds 
in the mixture or flowing through that sample, some of them travel faster, some of them travel slower. You can think of the sand or the silica gel as having little hands that some of the molecules can hold on to longer. Um, and so we can separate by um, the rate it takes those substances to flow through the solid support. So again, not something you're likely to see, but it's in the book. I wanted to mention it um, just so that you can see it. And then it's likely a technique that you're gonna come back to um, in future courses. Okay, so we did see an example of energy today. So the uh, um, nature of energy is it's a capacity to do work. So the capacity to do work means you have the capacity to put an object into motion. So we can use energy to move a car, so it's using the energy from some sort of reaction to put the car into motion. Or we can transfer heat. We can have a reaction take place that got hot. We could have heated up an object. We could maybe more control a combustion reaction like that one, burn natural gas with a flame, heat up a pot of water with it. So a stove could be the example of a chemical reaction releasing heat that heat can then be used to heat up an object. So we can transfer heat um, from object to object so uh, work is transferred when a force is exerted on the object, causing the object to move, displacing it. And then heat is just the idea of um, uh, the energy required to cause an increase in the temperature of the object. So different substances, uh, this is a topic in chapter five, but different substances have characteristic specific heat. So much heat it takes to raise that object's temperature, uh, a gram of that object by one degree. Like water specific heat is 4.184, uh, joules per gram Kelvin, or one calorie per gram Kelvin. So if you had a gram of water, and you wanted to heat it up by one degree C, it takes one calorie or 4.184 joules. So we'll talk about those uh, conversion factors and calculations related to energy changes when we get to uh, chapter five. So kinetic versus potential energy though, is an interesting problem because we could really link, like we were talking about with the H2O2 balloon, to the bicyclist at the top of the hill, so a bicyclist at the top of the hill is just waiting to either push themselves down, down the hill or maybe imagine there's a little bit of a hill that has to be overcome. Imagine there's a small hill. And if you go over that small hill, then you're going down that hill. That's the example of the O2 uh, hydrogen balloon. That the molecules here are just sitting in a relatively stable state until they see that flame. They see the flame, that's the nudge down the hill. That reaction takes place. And we have that energy being given off. I zoom in a little bit here. This is that energy being given off from that reaction that we saw with our eyes. And we saw it being given off very quickly because it's a fast reaction. Now, we could get into topics like, well, why is it a fast reaction? Because it turns out to be what we call like a cascade reaction, meaning you kind of kickstart one, re one of the reactions that take place. Like you break a bond in H2 that, that allows it to react with O2, that allows it to react with another H2, allows the water to be formed. And then the products of the water reaction give you another little radical that let you keep the reaction going. So it becomes what we call like a propagating reaction, where the reaction just keeps itself going, and then it, it, it happens so fast and keeps itself going that the reaction completes very quickly with that explosive force. Some equations, we don't do any equations in chapter one with energy, so there are a couple calculations in the chapter, but we're not gonna cover them, we're not gonna test you on any uh, conversion factors of energy in chapter one. We'll look at some of those equations when we get to chapter uh, five later. So kinetic energy, though, this is, I just wanted to include this. We know kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Um, and so that's just maybe a useful uh, thing to think about how kinetic energy is just based on the mass and the velocity of a particle or of a, an object. But then the potential energy is just the potential to do something. It's the here versus here. It's the analogy of the, the bicyclist at the top of the hill has high potential energy, the bottom of the hill low potential energy. H2O2, high potential energy. Water, low potential energy. So if we start with less stable re reactants for more stable products, then we have energy given off. If we want to flip the reaction, well, we need to do something like electrolysis. We've got to get that energy from somewhere. The example of electrolysis is now a topic from Chem 1220. That's a topic in Chapter 20. You'll actually look at how you can flip almost any reaction that takes place spontaneously, like the reaction here, that was spontaneous, went in the forward direction. We can flip it in the non-spontaneous direction with electricity, as long as we provide enough power for that reaction to take place. OK, so I'm going to skip a couple slides. I was just trying to make sure I get to sig figs to talk a little bit about sig figs today. Um, so that as you're thinking about this topic and maybe doing some lab activities, getting ready for lab, 
that we kind of get a base starting point of what sig figs are getting at. So significant figures are the digits in a measured quantity that, uh, including what we call the uncertain one, these are the significant figures. And what this is getting at, if I imagine having a value like 125 grams that I read off some sort of balance, that this value here is our uncertain digit. Meaning that whenever, you know when you use a balance again on a scale, that last digit's going up and down? That means there's some inherent uncertainty and it's going up, going down, and you're trying to eyeball the middle. You eyeball the middle because you're saying, well, the uncertainty is about plus or minus one in that uncertain digit. And so this is why we call that digit the uncertain digit. If we use a different device, and let's say it said 125.5 grams, and this digit here was going up and down a little bit, we eyeballed the middle, then we'd probably say the minimum uncertainty here would now be 125.5 plus or minus 0 0.1 grams. So our precision kind of goes with the number that we're reading off the scale. Now, the first value, the 125 grams here, we would say that this contains three significant figures. All three digits in the number are significant. Now, the significance of, of the three versus the next one here being four, there's four digits here, is that this value here is more precise. If we know the value to more decimal places, we call that greater precision. Um, now, we'll differentiate what we call accuracy. Accuracy will, is, well, what is the actual object's mass? That's the accuracy of the measurement. But the precision of the measurement is how many digits am I able to record? The more digits gives us more precision. So four sig figs more precise than three. And so when we're rounding calculations, when we start doing calculations, we're going to have to see how we round our results. Um, and so we have to round accordingly. And so what that means is that when we're doing 125 plus some other number, we're going to have to see how do we round, where do we round to? Because this plus minus is going to be the limiting factor or possibly the limiting factor when we go to round our values. So let's imagine we're adding these two particular measurements here. So we have two objects masses that we presumably recorded on two different scales. The plus minus one is going to be a bigger factor than the plus minus point one. So I'm going to end up rounding this to 250. I'm going to round up to 251 grams. To three sig figs because that plus minus one versus the plus minus point one, the plus minus one is what's getting in the way. It's the uncertainties here that are the problem. There's, they are what's causing us to need to round off these values and not just report the answer as 250.5. Okay, so it's the inherent impreciseness of what we are treating as measured quantities. Anytime we see an object or a value with units, we're assuming that that was some sort of measured quantity and it's subject to what we call significant figure rules. We're just scratching the surface here, so we'll get into more of sig figs and then some examples of calculations involving sig figs and their rules as we continue. All right, guys, have a great day.